going to be speaking about dietary diversity. We've, we've spent some time on this topic uh, uh, thus far, and we'll be spending much more time talking about it. Um, this is a, a presentation based on work that I'm doing with uh, Alicia Evans uh, at Purdue University. And I have to, I have to thank Shibani and uh, Patrick for kind of sparking my interest in this topic and Robin for helping me get access to the data that I'm going to be presenting. Um, just a little outline of, of where I plan to spend my time. Um, I'm going to be presenting some empirical results uh, from the annual household survey, but I want to start by, by trying to motivate it just a little bit. Um, so for those who can see this graph, um, on the horizontal axis, I've um, placed uh, the average household diversity score from the AHS um, for um, each district in Nepal. And on the y-axis, the, the vertical axis, I've placed the, the average height for age Z score from the DHS for each of those districts. So each dot in the figure represents a district um, and the combination of dietary diversity and child Z scores. Um, I, I do not in any way, shape, or form want to imply that there's causality between diversity scores or, or dietary diversity and child growth. Uh, at least I wouldn't want to conclude that from these data. But there is a, an association, and I think we all understand that that association is driven by several different things. Um, one, the fact that there are factors operating in the background that drive both dietary diversity and child nutrition outcomes. Um, and even if we attempt to control for all of those things that are kind of operating in the background, we have this uh, hypothesis and this belief that uh, child uh, nutrition um, and child growth outcomes will benefit from improvements in household dietary diversity, and in particular, uh, child dietary diversity. So that's part of the motivation for looking at this. And so the, the goal here is to kind of understand what's happening um, in the realm of dietary diversity uh, in the country. Uh, I'm an economist. Economists uh, spend a lot of time studying data and looking for stylized patterns, stylized facts. Uh, these data are from Nepal. On the left panel, I have the, um, the budget share um, that we observe in the annual household survey spent on food. Uh, on average, in Nepal, households spend about 60% of their income on food. Um, but as you can see from that graph, uh, that relationship is quite nonlinear. Very poor households spend a lot of their food on, or a lot of their income on food, and more uh, well, well off households spend less of their income on food. That stylized pattern is something that economists refer to as the Engel curve and it's very prominent in Nepal. Uh, on the right, I have the, the share of the food budget that's spent on starchy shit staples, so in other words, basic staples. And the other stylized fact or stylized pattern that we observe is that as households become uh, better off as measured in terms of income, uh, their budget share for starchy staples declines. Okay, so again, that's a, a kind of stylized fact a stylized pattern that fits with things that we see worldwide. Uh, why are those things important? Well, they're important because, in, in large part, changes in income drive changes in, in diet. And one of the things that we're interested in is understanding what other sorts of factors might drive dietary change in addition to income. So, I'm gonna try to answer two questions in the next 10 minutes or so. First, how diverse are diets in Nepal? and what explains observed patterns of both uh, food expenditures and household dietary diversity, consumption of animal sourced foods. Um, okay, so the data that I'm using come from the annual household survey. It's a very rich data set and I uh, appreciate uh, Robin helping me get access to it. Uh, we're gonna use three rounds of the data. That represents 11,809 households in our analysis. Uh, about roughly split between urban and rural, and all of the uh, information that I'm gonna present is population weighted. Um, 
We're looking at food and non-food expenditures. Um, food expenditures are based on seven-day recall. I was just thinking about my own diet this morning, um, and in the, the last seven days, my diet has been more diverse than it was in the last 24 hours. So the, uh, the fact that we're capturing seven days of, of food expenditure um, gives us a picture of perhaps a, a medium range um, diversity within the household. And we map the expenditures that we observe into 12 categories. So those 12 categories constitute the household dietary diversity score. And then uh, I won't spend a lot of time talking about the actual methods, but we use a, a whole series of regressions that are matched to the, to the data. Um, and just a couple of things to note. One is that um, the expenditures are converted to adult equivalent units. Uh, there are some districts that are not represented in the data due to lack of uh, information. So just uh, a, a couple of notes there. Okay, so this graph shows you um, dietary diversity uh, as, as based on this household dietary diversity score that ranges from 0 or 1 to 12 um, by district in Nepal. And the very first takeaway message that I want, want you to get from this is that there's very wide variation in dietary diversity across Nepal that's explained by, among other things, uh, geography and location. All right? and, Later, I'll make the point that about half of the variation that we observe in um, uh, dietary diversity is explained by location rather than other factors. And location tends to be as important in explaining dietary diversity as things like wealth and income and education combined. Okay? So I think that that's something that we just all need to keep in mind. Uh, the other thing that I've put on the graph is the rank order of items that make up the dietary diversity score. So if you want to think of this as the most popular food groups from top to bottom, nearly every household in Nepal consumes from the cereal, spices, vegetable, and oil categories. But relatively few households consume at the bottom of that list um, from dairy, fish, and eggs. And th that's a point that's been made repeatedly over the past day. Um, and in fact, uh, in, in the last seven days, I haven't eaten any fish, so I would, uh, I think, have a score of 11. Uh, whoops. What happened? There we go. Okay. This is uh, the same, same set of patterns, but for animal-sourced foods. So there are four categories of animal-sourced foods, uh, dairy, meat, uh, fish, and eggs. And as you can see, again, there's wide variation across location in Nepal um, for consumption of animal sourced foods. Uh, another take, takeaway message that you might want to um, keep in mind is that if you're trying to explain variation in dietary diversity in, in the context of these scores, um, really all of the movement in dietary diversity is explained by movements in animal sourced foods. Okay, so um, most of the the dietary diversity that we observe um, is driven by whether households are consuming from these animal sourced foods, food categories. Uh, and then I, I just, for, for sake of uh, bringing income back into the, the story, plot here income on the, uh, the horizontal axis and the dietary diversity score on the y axis. And so you can see that there is responsiveness of of dietary diversity to changes in income uh, from sort of the, the lowest incomes in Nepal, which are associated with dietary diversity scores of roughly five, up to um, the highest incomes, which are, are associated with dietary diversity scores of 10 or 11 um, in the sample. And because we have three rounds of data, we thought it would be interesting to look at whether there have been any changes uh, over, the, over the rounds of the survey. So these graphs just show uh, the food budget share, the dietary diversity score, and animal-sourced foods across the three rounds of the survey. And the one um, noteworthy finding here is that there has been a slight slippage in dietary diversity in the sample uh, over this period, and that's largely explained by um, lower amounts of animal-sourced foods reported. Um, these are statistically significant in the context of the survey, um, and so I think it 
you know, leads to a question of why, why that might be the case um, and, and what kinds of policy attention might be focused on, on that. Okay, so economists are interested in responsiveness, and so I'm gonna show you a couple of tables now that, that um, provide insights into how responsive dietary diversity, food expenditures, um, animal sourced food consumption is to various factors, right? And so the way to read this table in this case is just each number represents the percentage change in a variable of interest when something else changes by 1%, right? And the, the, in this case, we're looking at changes in per capita income. So the very top uh, left-hand corner, the, the, the number represents the fact that if you, ch if you increase a household's income by 1%, expenditures on all food items will increase by 0.68%. Okay, and, and I don't want to f spend a lot of time focusing on the numbers and which ones are significant, but I want, want to kind of draw attention to two things. As we look down the table, in this case, across the different categories, there are some differences. So for example, rural households tend to spend more of an increment of income on food than urban households. Um, there are some spatial patterns here across ecological zones. Um, there are very few differences in the data between female-headed and male-headed households, which I think is interesting. Um, but um, looking down the table, these different groups, there is some differentiation in their responsiveness. And then as we look across the table from foods to staples, we see that the responsiveness of income changes to staple expenditures is much less than to food in general. That's important, and I'll say why in just a second. Uh, and then as we look at household dietary diversity scores or the probability of consuming animal source foods, those are also relatively smaller in magnitude. Okay, and the point that I wanna make from this is that in terms of household responsiveness to changes in income, uh, Dietary diversity and consumption of animal source foods, while responsive to changes in income, are not strongly so, okay? So simply increasing incomes uh, will lead to improvements in dietary diversity and will lead to improvements or increases in animal source food consumption, but those responses are relatively weak, and so we have to look at other things besides just income to drive improvements in dietary diversity. What might be some of those things? Well, this is a more fully specified model in which we look at uh, uh, things like uh, income, but also uh, urban residents, agricultural households, female-headed households, household size, education, wealth, food consumed away from home, and things like the density of the road network uh, in, in, in the household vicinity. And these things um, are also contributors and statistically significant as such. So, again, as a point was made at the end of the day yesterday, we can't look for a single factor to move the needle on dietary diversity or animal source food consumption. All of these things work in concert. All of these things are important together in leading to improvements. Okay, so I think I have a couple of minutes, so let me just sum up. Uh, Diets are relatively diverse in Nepal on average, but there's quite a bit of uh, uh, spatial variability in those patterns and quite a bit of variability based on income. Location explains as much of the variation in diversity as income, wealth, and education combined. Okay? So that means there have to be some targeted approaches that are sensitive to location and diets in order to to um, affect change. Um, we see some evidence that dietary diversity has fallen just a little bit over time, mostly due to reductions in animal source food consumption. Um, and so if we look at the main drivers, we find income, wealth, family size, and education all consistently positive and significant. Uh, female headship, positive, but very modest in magnitude. Um, rural and agricultural households are um, negatively associated with dietary diversity, and road density and consumption outside the home are consistently uh, 
correlated with dietary diversity, suggesting that access to markets matters for improving dietary diversity. So those are some of the initial findings that are coming out of the uh, annual household survey. Very rich source of information. Those of you who are familiar with that data set and would like to talk about it uh, with me some more, I'd be happy to talk during the break. Thanks. Thank you.